Well, good morning, Cross Point. I'm really, uh, I'm excited to be back with you all. My family and I spent a few weeks uh, away taking a break and just having some really uh, fantastic time together. It was a huge blessing for Abby and I to get uh, all that quality time with our kids. And man, we had so much fun. Um, took them to the mountains and um, let them throw rocks at water. I, it turns out <laughs> that that's all they wanted in the whole world. Uh, was to pick up rocks and throw them at water. And so we had a ton of fun. I did really, really miss you guys. I, I am so thankful for this church. I'm so thankful for all of you. I'm so thankful for what God is doing here and so thankful for what this church means uh, to my family and to my kids. And, and um, really, I, like I did miss you guys, but I, don't, I really don't think I missed you as much as my kids did. Seriously, this is Allie, my daughter, while we were gone. Go to church. I'm going to church. I'm going to church, Daddy. Daddy. I'm going to church. <laughs> oh, she, she was very excited to be back with all of you today. Uh, today, I'm excited too, because we're starting this new series. Elijah, man, what an incredible life, uh, an incredible story recorded for us of his faithfulness and God's power. Uh, the events that we're going to talk about that are recorded here for us in 1 Kings happened around 2,500 years ago. And so there are some significant differences in their world and our world, in their culture and our culture, in their language and our language. And yet these truths, these principles, the life of Elijah is still so practical for us today. It's still so applicable to our lives. And so I am very excited to dive in, but um, if you know me very well at all, you know that whenever I'm talking about somebody in the Bible, I'm like, all right, so let me set the scene for you, okay? Uh, so let's talk context here. What is happening? Let me set the scene for us. Uh, Elijah is going to be a prophet. He's going to bring God's message to the people of Israel, this nation of Israel, and to understand what's happening with them, we have to back up, right? Their beginning starts with Abraham. And it's this guy that, that God says, hey, I want you to leave your, your father's home. I want you to leave your homeland and come and follow me. And, and, and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be faithful to me. And so I, I want you to step out in faith and trust me and I'm going to bless you. And so Abraham does this and follows God and, and becomes this, this patriarch for the Israelite nation that will eventually show up. And God promises him that his descendants will turn into this great nation. Um, but a few generations later, uh, they're, they're still just a family. And finally then, there are 12 sons, and it feels like, all right, mathematically here, we're, we're on a roll. If we could just do this from now on, in a few generations, we will we'll be a nation, right? And then this group of 12 boys end up moving to Egypt, which seems cool. God provides for them in it. There's an incredible story there. Um, but as we skip ahead, they move from, from guests, welcome guests in Egypt, to a people that are enslaved. And so numerically, the people of God have become a people, but they're not a nation. They're an enslaved people. They are a workforce. And then they are freed from that and spend some time traveling, wandering in the desert, figuring out their relationship with God and God really teaching them some lessons in the wilderness, and then finally they arrive at the promised land. They are a nation and it's happening and it's amazing. And they spend this time in the promised land and generation after generation, they have these leaders that we read about that are called judges that will show up and, and deal with a problem, deal with uh, the falling away of God's people and correct them and, and then the, they go away. And the, the people of God, this nation, they're looking around at all the other nations. They're like, man, we, we need what they have, right? We need a king. Like, that's going to solve it. 
This is it. Like the other nations, they have it figured out. God, we, we need a king. We need you to give us a king. There's some argument there. God's kind of like, hey, um, you already have one. It's me. I'm your king. But they insist that they need a human king because a human leader never fails his people, right? And so they, uh, they, get, they get a king. It goes bad. They get another king. It goes well. That's David. Many of you, whether you've been in church a lot or a little, you've heard of David at some point. He's the guy who kills Goliath. And David is there, and then David's son, Solomon. And then this thing happens after Solomon where the nation of Israel becomes divided and it it becomes two kingdoms. There's a, a northern kingdom that keeps the name Israel and a southern kingdom, Judah. And from there, there are separate nations and separate kings. And and here's the moral of the story from here, really what you need to know as we travel from king to king to king is it gets worse and worse and worse. And they are less and less faithful to God. They drift further and further away from the one who's been their deliverer, from the one who's been their provider, from this incredible God who has always kept his promises to them. And several generations in, we pick up this story during the reign in Israel, the northern kingdom of a king named Ahab. And he is introduced to us and described to us in chapter 16 of 1 Kings. And it, it, this is what the Bible has to say about him. Ahab son of Omri began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Isaiah's reign in Judah. So Judah's the southern kingdom, right? He reigned in Samaria 22 years, but Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. And as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, Jeroboam's kind of a famous name in the Old Testament because uh, every time a new king comes up, they'll be like, and he followed in the ways of Jerobo- Jeroboam. It's basically about being, he's the worst. Um, it's being, he's like Jeroboam. He married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians, and he began to bow down in worship of Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings before him. So he is not great. He is evil, Ahab. And on his own, he is bad. But then he marries this girl, Jezebel, and it gets worse, a lot worse. Jezebel is from another nation, and and her people worship this this idol, this made-up god, Baal. And when she moves to Israel, instead of teaching her the the ways of of their faith and of of the truth about God and his faithfulness and, and who he is, this Lord, the God of Israel, Ahab just starts to worship this false god. In fact, doesn't just worship him, builds a temple to him. In Israel, builds a temple to another god. Worships him, starts to encourage others to worship him, is leading the people of Israel towards worshiping this false god, this idol, and it's ugly, guys. It's not just that they've turned their backs on God, which is a really big deal. The ways that they are following this false god are ugly and gross. Some of the practices of worshiping these false gods involved things like child sacrifice. Um, In their false beliefs, their perversion had led them to name some really gross and perverted sexual practices as things that were worshiped to their false gods and they would go and do that in the temples. And Israel looks nothing like the people of God would look in our minds. And in the midst of this, in the midst of the people of God having forgotten the ways of God, in the midst of them having forgotten the power of God, God is faithful. At the absolute worst, he is faithful. 
And that is where Elijah steps in because God is going to remind his people who he is through this man named Elijah. And we'll pick up that in chapter 17, just a couple verses later, verse one of chapter 17. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. This is our introduction to Elijah. We get no backstory, right? Elijah, the dude from this place, told the king, no more rain. As surely as God lives. Elijah's very name here makes a statement, okay? As he approaches this conversation with the king, Elijah's name means, my God is Yahweh. And Yahweh was the name of the Hebrew God. It is the name of the God of Israel. It's, it's, it's what they called our God, Yahweh. And so he is declaring with his very name, my God is not Baal. My God is none of these false idols that you are worshiping. It's not the gods of Canaan. It, it, it is none of these gods. My God is Yahweh. And then the gauntlet that he throws down here is huge, right? Now for us in Southwest Florida, at the end of dry season, we encounter a time where we're like, all right, I wish it would rain, you know? My grass is looking pretty rough, you know? It'd be nice if it would green up a little bit. Um, but overall, we have no idea what it's like when a real drought hits a community that is based in agriculture, right? Some of you are from the Midwest and you, you grew up, maybe you grew up on a farm or you had friends that had a farm and you understand when it has been dry for too long, people start to get antsy and it's intense. Their food source is agricultural. They need the rain to happen here. And so on its own, this is a big deal. But to take it one step further, this, this false god, this god of Jezebel, Baal, is the god of the storm. As we've uncovered ancient artifacts of him, he's, he's often holding like a lightning bolt or something. Like they have statues of this false god. And, and that's what he's doing. He is the god of the storm. That's his thing. All right, so we think about God and we're like, all right, God is sovereign. God rules over everything. They had different gods for different things, right? And so to say here, my God is the Lord, my God is Yahweh, my God is the God of Israel, the, the real one, and here's how I'm going to prove it to you, no more rain. The thing that, that God you worship the thing that he's supposed to have control over, the one piece of all of this that he is supposed to be able to command, he doesn't. And I'm going to prove it to you. This is a bold confrontation, to say the least. And so this has been thrown down. No more rain. In verse 2, then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat whatever the ravens bring for you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camp beside Kareth Brook east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. So he throws this down. This is what's going to happen. We're shutting it down. Then God's like, all right, I want you to go to this brook, Kareth Brook. The name of this uh, comes from uh, the Hebrew word karath, which means to cut off or cut down. There's a little like, interesting tidbit for you here, right? To cut off or cut down. It's like, hey, I want you to go to this space all by yourself. In fact, I want you to go to the brook that we named after being cut off or cut down and wait. And while he's there, he's going to have food service from Ravens, which is apparently a new food delivery app that I haven't downloaded yet. And uh, they are just bringing him food every single day. And he waits there, cut off and cut down. And this is a theme in scripture, right? This, 
This moment where somebody who is following God is taken out into the wild, out into the wilderness, and they are to rely on God to meet their needs there. They're cut off from the rest of the world, and we've seen this over and over and over again. We, we see it in the life of Abraham. We, we see it in the life of David. We see it in the nation of Israel as they wander in the desert. We, we see this show up here for Elijah. We'll see it in the New Testament, in, in John the Baptist and Jesus, where, where these, these people of God are pulled away from the world and they learn to rely on him. They learn to trust him every single day. And God does work in those seasons. Like we see that happen. God teaches people in these times to trust him, to rely on him, to have faith in him. And I think too often we want the mountain that comes after that without going through the time in the wild, right? Like we want the victory over Goliath. We want the promised land, right? We want the thousands and thousands of descendants. We, we, we want the lines of people waiting to get baptized or the miracles or whatever it is in your life. We want the thing that comes after without going through the time alone. Without going through the season where we are cut off and cut down. Where we are, are reshaped in the image of God, where God does work in our hearts in these times. And can I challenge you a little bit here today? If you are going in a season where spending time in a ravine named after being cut off or cut down feels like your life right now, like a really good way to describe your life right now, um, could I challenge you to as, with as much intensity as you ever have at any moment in your life to pursue after God? to chase after not him fixing your physical situation, but to chase after the work that he wants to do in your life. To chase after the, the work that he wants to do in your heart. Look, our God is a God who provides. That is a clear message of scripture. That is something that God is demonstrating for Elijah here, but he's also a God who teaches us to be dependent on him. Because we believe the lie that we're not. When in reality, we, we always have been. We always have been and we always will be dependent on him. I mean, notice here, right? How much food does Elijah get? Does he get like a three-week supply? Is it like a cargo thing that's dropped in on him? No, like they, they drop in a little bit of food for the day. And then the next day, and the next day, and the next one. And guys, God is our provider, but, but we have to learn to trust him daily. I think too often we're in, in, in seasons where we are facing fear, we are facing discomfort, and, and I think God would say to us in those moments, hey, I will be your provision for today or you feel weak. And God would say to you, I will be your strength for today. Your friends abandon you and you feel alone and like nobody cares and God says, hey, I will be your comforter, I will be your friend. You are not alone. I have you today. Right, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, give us this day not our month's supply, not our week's supply. Give us this day our daily bread. God, could you provide what I need for today? And God provides what Elijah needs for that day. In verse 7, the, the story continues here. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. The brook dried up. God's doing what he said he was going to do. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and, and live in the village of Zephareth, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. 
So just as he's getting comfortable here, right? He's found the rhythm, right? It's like, all right, the, the ravens come every day, all right? They show up, it's awesome, all right? There's water for me to drink. Like, this is pretty good. Like, this is nice, you know? This is good. Just as he's kind of finding that rhythm, the brook dries up and God's like, all right, you gotta go somewhere else now to rely on somebody else to take care of you. I'm going to teach you to trust again and in a new way. And this journey that he would have gone on is about 75 miles, and he would have traveled mostly through desert, okay? Um, The calculations are rough, but it would have taken him approximately 25 hours of walking to get there. So not a short journey in the desert during a famine, He's not really hopping from town to town, probably. He has to walk through a big chunk of Israel here, the nation where he is Israel's most wanted because he threw down the gauntlet. Hey, guess what? No rain until I say so. So they are after him. They are trying to find Elijah anywhere that they can. They are looking in every village, every town. They are after him. And so Elijah has to embark on a journey alone with very little provision to get to this place. But, but once again, he's learned to rely on God. He's learned to trust him. And so he steps out in obedience here. So in verse 10, so he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called her, "Uh, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in my house and I only have a handful of flour left in a jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Wow. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when I, the Lord, send rain on the crops again. But make a little bread for me first. And put yourself in her shoes for a second, right? I don't know if it's a dream. I don't know how God sent word ahead, but he said that he was going to send word ahead to a widow. So I don't I don't know how this happens. God regularly uses dreams, so we're just going to say maybe that's the version here, right? So maybe one night she's, she's so hungry, she's starving, and she receives word, hey, I'm sending my prophet to your town. When he gets there, I want you to take care of him. She has this dream, and, and, it's, and, and it's the message from God, and, and I imagine waking up the next morning, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and all morning trying to convince myself right? If I was in her shoes all morning, I'm trying to convince myself, like, that was just a weird dream, right? Like, that was just a strange dream. I'm really hungry. This is some kind of weird hunger dreams, right? And then a prophet shows up while I'm out gathering some sticks because I'm so hungry and I'm so tired. And I'm like, you know what? I give up to the point that I'm just going to cook what we have left and then we'll just die, and while I'm trying to get through that, trying to just, just gather enough strength to have one more meal with my child, this dude comes walking up. He's a prophet of God. And he starts asking me for stuff. And so I tell him the truth. Like, I don't literally have anything to give you. Like, there's one, maybe like one small chunk of bread left for me to make. And, and it's all that stands between death for me and my son. In fact, we know death comes afterwards. You're going to take that from me? You're going to rob me of this? And, and then he makes this promise that like, don't worry, you won't run out of supplies. Like, it'll be fine. 
I'll take care of you. I'm, I'm going I'm to come through for you in this time. In that moment, right? Like, like that's cool, but could I make bread for me first, right? Like, could I, could I go ahead and see that, that the flour is going to replenish? Can I go ahead and see that the oil is going to replenish before I give you food? No, make it for me first. Step out in faith here. Step out beyond what makes sense, beyond what you can add up, but beyond what works in a calculator, beyond what your friends would tell you is wise. Step out in faith and trust me. Put your trust in me is what the Lord says to her, right? And so she does it. She steps out in this faith, in, in this, this moment of unknown. And Crosspoint, can I ask you, where do you need to step out in faith? Where, where do you need to step out into the unknown? Beyond what makes sense, beyond what you can add up, beyond what's comfortable, into what is unknown into what doesn't even seem wise. Is it in your work? Are, are, are you having to, to work in a way that, that, while it's not wrong, it's not maybe illegal, like you know that, that the practices that you are conducting business with, that they don't honor God, they don't really have high integrity, but, but, but it makes ends meet. Helps you hit those sales goals, right? It, you cut a little bit of, cons of corners when you're out there working, but it's fine. I think many of us need to step into the unknown, step into what doesn't make sense, what doesn't add up, what we cannot compute. I, I know that there, it's an example that's overused in church, so just like bear with me, but like, People, I hear them all the time talk about like, man, I wish Chick-fil-A was open on Sunday mornings, right? Because here's the deal. There's nothing like worshiping Jesus and then getting some of his chicken, right? Like that's, and, and I get it. But every time I hear that, I'm like, man, I hope they're never open on Sunday. Because I love the fact that in our world that is about profit margin and revenue and that every quarter has to overcome the previous quarter and all of that, and they have all this competition. And I love that in the midst of that, they're like, we're closed one day a week. We're just closed. And we're just going to lose out on that opportunity. Like, we're just going to lose out on that revenue. We're just, like, I don't care. It's what we feel like we need to do. And I, I don't... I don't think that anybody who works for a company that isn't closed one day a week is like this horrible, horrible, horrible human, Okay? But God does command us to take a Sabbath and to rest. That, that's a command in Scripture. And so they, they feel like for them to operate with integrity, they have to be faithful to that. And so they've stepped out into the unknown, into what doesn't make sense. And they've trusted God's going to take care of it. God's going to provide Maybe for you, it is your marriage that you need to step out into the unknown. They're not holding up their end, but you're not really either, and, and things are not good, and they're rocky. And maybe you need to step out into the unknown and trust God and, and love them, not because they've earned it or they deserve it, but love them because you made a commitment before God that, that you were going to choose to love them that you were going to choose to serve them, that you were going to choose to put their needs ahead of your own and to step out in faith and trust and not trust them, not trust like, I'll try for 10 days and if at the end of 10 days they haven't fixed everything that's wrong with them, well, I tried, God. Like, not trust them, but trust God. Trust that God's gonna come through. Trust that God's gonna provide. Trust that God will be faithful. Trust that God is someone that you can always count on no matter what. 
Maybe, maybe it's your finances that you need to step out into what doesn't make sense because numbers are hard, right? Like we have calculators and some of you can just do math on your own. That's crazy. Um, but like we can see the numbers and, and, and it's hard right now, right? Like the number that you used to put in the grocery budget every month that like worked, all of a sudden now it doesn't work anymore. You're having to figure out how to put a bigger number in there because the food got more expensive and and on top of all that, you're, you're reading through scripture and you're like, God, you want me to give some of this away? Like, God, I can't even make the numbers work as they are now. And it's not just theoretical. It's not like hypothetical. This is, I, I have math here, Lord. Maybe for you, that's where you need to step into the unknown and trust him and say, God, your Lord, including over of my finances. Maybe for you, it's how you share Jesus, right? Sharing Jesus is really difficult in our world today. It is, it is really, really uncomfortable. It's not politi politically correct. I can barely get myself to say those words. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, it's not. Um, we live in a world that says, hey, if that's what they believe, they, they can believe it and that's fine. Um, but what we believe is that there are tens of thousands of people in our city who don't have Jesus and therefore do not have salvation. And I believe that with everything in me and so is a little bit of discomfort something that I should just say, well, God would say absolutely not, but our culture would say, that's not your spot, it's not your business. Let them do what they want to do and you do what you want to do. You believe what you want to believe. Let them believe what they want to believe. For many of us, we, we need to step into the unknown and say, you know what, I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to look at the people I work with and, and think, how can I be intentional? How can I share what God is doing in my life? How can I share how God has transformed who I am because of his goodness? How can I share his faithfulness with you? How can I tell these stories to you? And step out beyond what's comfortable and beyond what is easy into the unknown. In fact, I have a really specific challenge for us in the month of July, Crosspoint. All right, here's my challenge for us. This next month, I want to challenge every single one of us to host someone who does not believe in Jesus in our homes, to share a meal with a coworker, a friend, a family member, another mom, like I don't care what your life, like what makes sense in your context, but to invite somebody who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, who is not a follower of Jesus, to be in your home, to spend time with you and your kids, and for you to have the opportunity, not to try to force Jesus on them, but for you to have an opportunity in real relationship to share Jesus with them, to share what Jesus is doing in your life, to share the difference that he makes in your marriage or in your parenting or in your work. And I wanna challenge every single one of us to live this out. And, and we're faced to ask this question, right? If, if, if we do this, what's gonna happen? Like, if, like I, don't, I don't know for sure. I don't know what's gonna happen if we do this. And, and here's the deal, I don't, I don't know for sure. I can't tell you, here's exactly how it will go. But, but here's the end of our text today, right? Verse 15, so she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Here is what, what I know is true. I know that if we will step out in faith, if we will step out in obedience, if we will step out beyond from what's comfortable and into the unknown, I know, I know that God will move both in us and through us. I know that God wants to work in our hearts 
as we find ourselves cut off, as we find ourselves in the valley, as we find ourselves struggling and relying on him every single day, I know he wants to to work in our hearts, that he wants to, to teach us about who he is. But I also know he wants to work through us. And so Crosspoint, I wanna challenge you today. Step out into the unknown. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you that you are a God who will always provide. Lord God, I thank you for Elijah's faithfulness. I thank you for the way that he continually trusts in you, God, that he trusts that you will provide each new day, Lord, and help us to have that kind of faith, God. A faith that believes that you will provide, that we don't have to see it, we don't, we don't have to, to see the six-month supply. We don't have to see the three-month supply. We don't have to, to, to know where you are leading us to know that it is good. Father God, we trust you with all. We trust you, and we're going to step out into the unknown. Father God, I, I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.